Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the 29th Schrodinger Lecture. This is uh, one of the highlights of the year, and it is a tribute to the brilliance and lasting influence of the work of Erwin Schrodinger. And it is an opportunity to hear exciting new ideas from some of the world's great researchers. Imperial has a special connection to Erwin Schrodinger. A celebration of the centenary of his birth was held at Imperial 30 years ago. It was a global gathering of scholars from the UK, US, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Australia, Austria, Japan, Ireland, and Italy. The participants included Stephen Hawking, Linus Pauling, and our own beloved Sir Tom Kibble, to name just a few. We are pleased tonight to have members of the Schrodinger family here with us, and we welcome them back. And we continue to honor Professor Schrodinger's memory through the Schrodinger Scholarships. These scholarships attract our most outstanding PhD students in the natural sciences, and we are grateful for those who have supported and these talented students. There are 11 of us with, here with us this evening. So tonight's speaker is a world leader in probability and statistics. He is a very appropriate choice for this lecture as we celebrate the compelling questions posed by Schrodinger to push our understanding of probability and statistical physics. Professor David Hand joined Imperial in 1999 Formerly the chair in statistics, David is now a senior research investigator and emeritus professor of mathematics. His many honors include being a fellow of the British Academy, and in 2013, he was awarded the OBE for his services to research and innovation. David is also the chief scientific advisor to Winton Capital Management. David possesses a penetrating intellect and a special ability to bring his themes and key points to life through interesting examples. He is an engaging and entertaining speaker whose passion for his work and his profession shine through. David's interests are broad and they are extremely important to our times. Some of the topics he has written on include measurement, data mining, big data, information generation, the well-being of nations, and the improbability principle. His article on the improbability principle is one of the highlights of the latest issue of the Imperial Magazine. David's papers and books have advanced the discipline of statistics. And perhaps just as significantly, he has advanced the understanding and perception of statistics among academics and non-academics alike through his two terms as president of the Royal Statistical Society and his many interviews, lectures, and talks. David sees statistics as the most exciting of disciplines, not the dry and dusty subject that it is perceived to be. He has said that data are evidence and to extract meaning meaning information and knowledge from data, you need statistics. He sees the world as the statistician's oyster, and he sees statisticians as the modern day version of the 19th century explorer. Indeed, David is such an explorer as he collaborates to solve problems across disciplines. In his lecture this evening, data, data, everywhere, but let's just stop and think David begins with the observation that people want answers to questions, not simply data. He will answer your questions after his lecture, so you can start thinking of them throughout the lecture. And after a vote of thanks from Professor Tom Welton, the Dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences, you are invited to a reception to meet researchers from across the faculty explaining their research related to data and statistics. I anticipate a wonderfully stimulating evening, and it is my honor to introduce Professor David Hand. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed. I can't guarantee to be able to answer your questions at the end of this lecture. Um, it's a great honour uh, to be invited to give this talk. When I was young, Erwin Schrodinger was um, one of my heroes, revolutionising physics and making major contributions to other scientific disciplines. Of course, now that I'm grown up, he's still one of my heroes. Um, I'm an enthusiast for data. My whole life has been about data. I, I spend my time looking at data in different ways, trying to understand it, to understand the mechanisms generating it and making predictions on the basis of it. The reason I'm stressing this is that this talk is going to be largely cautionary. Although I'm an enthusiast, I'm also a realist. Although big data and data science hold huge promise, life is seldom simple. So that's my reason for stressing right at the start that I'm a data enthusiast. I don't want you to leave here thinking David Han doesn't believe in the data revolution. What I want is for you to leave here appreciating that while data and its analysis do indeed hold huge promise for improving the human condition, we have to be careful. The fact that we now have immensely powerful tools for extracting meaning and illumination from data doesn't mean that we can disconnect our brains. And that's really the point about my title. Data everywhere, very important, going to make a huge change to humanity but we have to keep thinking about what we're doing. So here's a quotation that you have all seen this kind of thing before. This is from very eminent management consultancy, McKinsey. We're on the cusp of a tremendous wave of innovation, productivity, and growth, all driven by big data. That's referring to business, economics, and so on, but you can find similar quotations for any other area, science, medicine, government, whatever you like. Since this talk is about data, let me give you some data. This is Google Trends search on the phrase data science, and you can see that starting in about 2001, just there, the number of searches for this phrase started to increase and is continuing to increase more and more each year. There's a tremendous amount of interest in it. Here's another data set, hopefully. This is not... Ah, here's another data set. American students, I'm afraid, but the number of students studying statistics and biostatistics, and it's similar in the UK. The red line shows master's students, and you can see that starting from about 2001, the number of students doing this suddenly started to rocket more and more each year. Similar sort of thing for the number of PhD students, which is the green line suddenly started to increase. Bachelor's students, first degree students, it took them a while to cotton on, but a few years later, that all started, also started going through the roof. So people studying degrees are signing up to this. They're recognize, recognizing that if they want to make important contributions, if they want to get good jobs, paying them a lot of money and so on, this is where it's at. Ah, there must be a place for me to point this, which... Okay. Now, you've all seen... What, what, I, what I want to focus on now is why is all this happening now? And you've all seen graphs like this. One of the reasons why it's happening now is the growth in the memory of computers and hence the sizes of data sets that we can uh, store and manipulate, big data if you like. And you've all seen graphs like this one here. Um, on the horizontal axis, we've got, we've got time. On the vertical axis, in a logarithmic scale, we've got the size of computer memory. Logarithmic scale, meaning that if the line is a straight line, things are get, in fact getting faster and faster and faster as time proceeds. It's really an exponential increase. And I've put on the left some indications, some examples of the sorts of uh, uh, numbers that we're witnessing. The large synoptic space telescope, 30 trillion observations of trillions, 10 to the 12th. So, you know, huge data sets, huge capacity for memory of modern computers. That's one of the reasons why it's happening now. Another reason why it's happening now is that computers are getting faster and faster. Similar sort of curve, similar sort of diagram to the one I just showed you. Time on the horizontal axis and on a logarithmic scale, the speed of computers. And there's a third reason, which I personally think is at least as important as those two reasons. And this is automatic data capture, electronic data capture, electronic measuring instruments. No longer do we have to go around with a clipboard recording, observa recording observations about what people say or what they do. More and more, the measurements are just captured automatically by uh, electronic devices. So, for instance, take, um, 
Take somebody in an intensive care unit in a hospital. Instead of a nurse going in every half hour to measure the patient's pulse, we have devices which clip on the patient's finger and which measure the pulse all the time in real time and send that data straight to the computer. It's called streaming data. It just keeps on coming. It's an example of automatic data capture. Often the automatic data capture is secondary. So in um, credit card, uh, so let's take supermarket transactions as, as, as an example. The primary reason for someone adding up your, the, the cost of your items at the, the checkout is to calculate the bill, how much you'll have to pay. But once the data has been entered, it can be sent straight to the computer. If you like, it's data exhaust from the primary activity. Uh, so often data are secondary. And data come in all sorts of shapes and forms now. I've got a couple of examples up there on the left. This is from one of my um, studies some years ago. Um, each each uh, figure there is the amount withdrawn from a particular ATM machine, a hole-in-the-wall cash machine, over the course of about two and a half years. And you can see from that signal, that trace, that about halfway through this period, something happened. For some reason or other, people started using that machine in a different way. And you can explore that, why that is. Maybe a competitor installed a machine next door or whatever. You can start to investigate it. And on the right, I've just got a stock image showing you the notion that a lot of data now comes in other forms, such as uh, images, pictures. And the final reason why all this is happening now is what's called open data, a move towards making data accessible to anybody to use, maybe people who are launching startups or, or whatever. This occurs basically in two forms. On the, less, on the left, um, in science, you get a lot of open data. So, for instance, astronomy. Astronomical devices to collect astronomical data are vastly expensive. Might involve a space telescope, might involve putting a telescope on a mountain in South America or something. Vastly expensive. So astronomers share all their data. They make it open to everybody in the community to analyze. And on the other side, we have um, what's called open data in society. So I chair something called the Administrative Data Research Network, which takes data from different government departments, links them in particularly secure uh, and highly protected environments so that people can explore the effectiveness of public policies uh, and uh, social science. So open data. So those are the four primary drivers, I think, to answer the question, why is all this happening now? Now, I'd like to say, sort of parenthetically, early on in this talk, that there are two fundamental aspects to capitalizing on this data revolution. The, the first one is understanding inference and forecasting. So, for instance, taking the Higgs boson as an example, massive data set, we've got models which describe what the data ought to look like, and we're looking for little peaks, features, aspects of the model. We're trying to infer something, trying to understand it, trying to model the data in a large scale, if you like. Climate change is, is another example. Vast amounts of data and huge amounts of uncertainty, and we're looking for trends in it. So it's large-scale understanding and inference that this is all about. And that's one aspect. The second aspect involves not inference and statistics and machine learning, but mathematics and computer science, searching, matching, and choosing. So, for instance, Uber doesn't involve clever statistical inferential procedures, what's going on. It's not, it doesn't involve that but it does involve rapid search procedures so that you can find the taxi which is nearest to you or which could get to you most quickly. So broadly speaking, we have two different sorts of classes of tools which are coming together. For the top one, statistics, machine learning, and so on. For the bottom one, mathematics and computer science. Now, this is, of course, an artificial separation. They really, uh, um, they often overlap. So in fraud detection, for instance, um, you'll find that both of these classes of tools are, are, are used. Now, Many of you have been to talks on big data and data science before. And the, what I've said so far is the sort of thing you will have heard. You will have heard how wonderful it's all going to be, how it's going to revolutionize the world, how we're all, disease is going to all be cured, and so on. And perhaps make it sound easy. But I said at the start, this is a cautionary talk. First, we need the technical skills and understanding to do that. Hence, those number of students are beginning to recognize that and study these things. And indeed, that's what we teach here at Imperial College and at universities in general. We teach the skills. But there's more to it than that. We also need to be aware of the risks. We need to understand the problems which might arise, the challenges, the obstacles we have to overcome which will make this happen. And I'm afraid that's what this talk is really going to be about. 
So here are some of the challenges. What I'm going to do on this slide is list the challenges. I'm going to give them particular names. Then I'm going to go through some examples of them. So the first challenge I call bad data. This is not the data you want, uh, but a distorted version. So for example, your bathroom scales, for instance, might only go up to 120 kilograms, 135 kilograms. The data will have been truncated at that level. If you weigh more than that, that's what the lever, that's what the, the indicator of the needle will record. So it's bad data. That's just an example. My second, exam, my, my second type of challenge is what I call invisible data. Not just the data you've got, but the data you'd like. So I might have data on customers who use my business if I run a business. But what I'd also like to know is about the people who don't use my business, who aren't my customers, because they're the ones I would like to recruit as customers. I haven't got the data on them. It's invisible data. Thirdly, I've got changing data. Not the data you've got, but the data you'll have. Anybody who's been around for the last 10 years will have seen how the world global economy has changed. Things change. Statisticians say it's non-stationary, so changing data. And then fourthly, alternative data. Not the data you've got, but the data you would have had. I know how the patients responded when I gave them treatment A, but I'd also like to know how they would have responded had I given them treatment B. But that's not there. That's alternative data. And then finally, misleading data. Not the data you've got, uh, but the data you think you've got. So, for example, I might have a database of ages of people with some missing values, and unknown to me, maybe the missing, value, missing values have been coded as 99 to indicate a missing value. But you can see immediately the problems that this could cause. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through the first of these topics and give you examples and dig down into them a bit more. And then I'm just going to briefly give you one example of each of the remaining three. So I'm going to do the first two and then briefly go over the remaining three. So let's look at bad data. That's not the data you want, but a distorted version. So here's a little quote from the Times a few years ago. Britain's largest bat, the greater mouse-eared bat, which was officially declared extinct in the UK 12 years ago, has been rediscovered hibernating in an underground hole in West Sussex. They can weigh up to 30 kilograms and have ears as long as three centimetres. Now, this is Imperial College. You all know about units of measurement, and you've spotted the problem with this observation which appeared in the Times. Some of the readers of the Times also spotted the problem, and the next day, some letters appeared. One of them said, Dear Sir, 30 kilograms, the weight you quote, is a lot of bat. <laughs> more, more like my seven-year-old nephew in his Batman suit. <laughs> Have you any idea of the collateral damage a single 30 kilogram bat could do if, if it recklessly flew into you one night? <laughs> or the type of diet required to sustain such a remarkable animal? As I hear of no sudden decline in the cat population of West Sussex, I conclude that your report is incorrect. Another one said, if the greater mouse-eared bat weighs some 66 pounds, as a resident of West Sussex, I feel I should stay indoors at night until it's de <laughs> declared extinct again. <laughs> and another one said, our somewhat overweight yellow Labrador just about weighs 30 kilograms. The thought of him equipped with leathery wings and airborne fair boggles the imagination. And at the foot of these letters, a note appeared in the Times which said, a greater mouse-eared bat usually weighs about 30 grams, not 30 kilograms. Here's another example of something similar to that. That, that last example was really about metadata, problems with the data about data. Here's one which appeared in the Times just last week, very similar to that, much more serious. Two students suffered life-threatening reactions when they were given enough caffeine for 300 cups of coffee. They spent several um, days in intensive care unit on dialysis. Similar sort of problem to the last one. Why was that? Well, they should have been given a third of a gram of caffeine. Instead, they were given 30 and 100 times as much. Similar sort of problem. So the bat example was entertaining, but it can have serious consequences. Problems with the metadata. Still not perhaps very expensive. Here's something similar sort of problem, which was much more costly. Some of you will remember this. The Mars Climate Orbiter it was launched in 98, but it crashed when it reached Mars when, because the, the trajectory brought it into the Martian atmosphere where it broke up, brought it too close to Mars. Why was that? Well, 
One of the software teams, these things that always involve multiple teams, forgot to convert imperial units to SI units. Very expensive, hundreds of millions of dollars down the drain. Hundreds of millions of dollars. So what kind of costs are we talking about because of bad data? Here's one estimate from IBM, respectable source. Apparently it costs, they estimated it costs the US economy around $3 trillion per year. Now, there are two interesting observations to make about this number. The first is, could it be right? Economists here will know that the GDP of the US is about $18 trillion a year. So this seems like a huge number. Maybe it's bad data. I'm just raising that question. The other observation is to make it clear that one has to be very careful about definitions. So perhaps this $3 trillion includes the costs, the cost of the Martian orbiter, for instance, the cost lost due to bad data, the cost of systems to try to prevent bad data, the cost of efforts to try to remedy the bad data once it's discovered and so on. So maybe it adds up to $3 trillion if you use the right definition. But we have to be aware of bad data. The real lesson to learn from this $3 trillion is treat numbers with skepticism. Think, could that actually be right? So what causes bad data? Well, human error, of course. Here's a simple example. Um, shares in a particular company losing overnight, immediately, $200 million after a broker tried to sell 600,000 shares for one yen instead of one share for 600,000. <laughs> We've all heard of fat finger errors where somebody, a trader, accidentally hits two keys instead of, instead of one and so on. So that's one cause of bad data. Another one of poor collection methods. So this is from a database of medical doctors, and it shows their birth dates. And there was an extraordinarily high peak of doctors who had apparently born on, been born on the 11th of November 1911. Now, I can't think of any reason why people born on that date should, you know, 20 years later, decide to become doctors. It's much more likely to be bad data, and the, peak, the height of the peak was such that it clearly was bad data. Now, academics are very fond of testing and examining students, so this is your test question. And the answer would be found at the end of the book, or in this case, the end of the talk. Um, but if you get bored listening to me droning on, you might like to think about what sort of bad data mechanism, why could that bad data have been produced? What would have produced that peak? I'll come back to it at the end. And then here's another example. I mentioned that I was interested in fraud um, from a scientific perspective. And um, one of the... Oh, I, I, I have an example. But bad data can be deliberate. It can be that people are, are, are making up the data. And, and this is an example. This isn't from my work, but it illustrates it very nicely. The black curve, it starts in 1917 and goes on to basically the present, just before the present. The black curve shows you the number of scientific papers published each year. And the peak at the right-hand side is about, is about a million a year. That's sort of ballpark. That's how many scientific papers are published each year nowadays. The blue curve um, shows you the number of scientific papers retracted each year because of problems with the data, because of errors in the data. And it's peaking at about 1,200 or something like that. The red curve shows you the number of papers retracted each year for fraud. The data were found to be corrupt, misleading, deliberately, deliberately so. It peaks at about 80. The fact that these, the blue and the red curves fall off towards the end as we near the present is, in fact, not a, a cause for relief. What it really shows is an example of what I'm going to talk about in a moment, invisible data. Those data have not yet been collected. And if you look at the shapes of the blue and red curves, they're sort of exponentially increasing. The chances are that they will be that much higher uh, as time goes on. So not good news. Bad data. Bad data can be deliberate as well. Oh, here's another little example. This is from a very important book on data mining. Uh, Michael Berry and Gordon Linoff said, gave this example. The data's clean because it's automatically generated. No human ever touches it. They then went on to say, it turned out that 20% of the transactions had arrived before they were sent. <laughs> and the reason for that is, not only didn't people never touch the data, they didn't set the clocks on the computers either. <laughs> so untouched by human hands doesn't necessarily mean good. And here's another example of it not, not merely being human error. This is from um, one of my PhD students. 
on the horizontal axis, we've got wind speed. He, he was studying the effect of inclement weather on telecommunications network, whether moisture gets into junction boxes, that kind of thing. So we've got wind speed along the horizontal axis. It's usually oscillating around 10 miles an hour or something like that. But occasionally, you get these giant spikes where it goes up to, look, it looks like a ceiling effect, like I mentioned earlier. It goes up to 75 miles, uh, 750, I should say, miles an hour. Never gets above that. Now, this was very curious, not least because nobody could remember these sudden, extraordinary Michael Fish moments, these gales. <laughs> Clearly, it's a kind of bad data. And what it turned out was that the automatic wind measuring instrument was resetting itself at midnight and so spuriously generating this, the, the, these bizarre apparent gusts of wind. The point about this really is that if you hadn't seen that plot, if you hadn't noticed these, big, these extraordinarily large values, you'd have analyzed the data and drawn completely misleading conclusions. And that's the fundamental issue about bad data and the other kinds of data problems that I'm going to be talking about. So, I said, what causes bad data? Now, unfortunately, um, it can occur in an unlimited um, number of ways. I'm reminded of Tolstoy, you know, every bad data set is bad in its own way. Uh, can occur in an unlimited number of ways. And we're talking about billion, uh, billions of data points now, large data sets. You can't check a billion data points by hand. Context, there are about 32 million seconds in a year, so it would take you 30 years to check a billion data points by hand without sleeping or eating or just looking at one a second, not looking at the relationships between them. Quite infeasible. So there's an important lesson there, which is that the computer is a necessary intermediary. Now, it's the computer that's making all this possible, enabling us to store these large data sets and then manipulate them and process them. But it's also a barrier between us and the data. The computer's a window on the data, but windows can get dirty. So the lesson from this is you should always maintain a healthy skepticism. And I'd like just to remind you of Twyman's law. Anything, any figure that looks interesting or different is usually wrong. <laughs> there are other aspects of bad data. The Office for National Statistics in the UK lists these. I'm not going to have time to go into them today, but those are other aspects of bad data. Okay, I want to move on to my second class of problems with data, invisible data, I call it. Not just the data you've got, but also the data you like. Now, you'll all recognize this. This is the space shuttle being launched. And some of you will remember this. January 1986. Space shuttle launch. And that happened. The Space Shuttle, the Challenger Space Shuttle disaster, 1986. I'll stop it there. The night before the launch, a three-hour teleconference was held between Morton Theocol, the Marshall Space Flight Center, and the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Morton Theocol made the booster rockets for this. Those rockets are huge. They're 149 feet tall. They're 38 feet in circumference. Um, and they're made in several different segments. Between each segment, there's something called an O-ring, which seals the joint. You've probably heard of those. Um, these O-rings are made of a sort of rudder-like material. They're a quarter of an inch in diameter, and they stretch all the way around this 38-foot circumference. When the O-rings are on the launch pad, they seal a gap which is four one-thousandths <coughs> of an inch big. And then when the rocket's launch, that gap expands to six one-hundredths, 0 0.06 of an inch and stays expanded for six-tenths of a second. Actually, these, these um, booster rockets are sort of a triumph of engineering. Think of the scale range. 149 feet, 38 feet, six-tenths of a second, um, and, and six-hundredths uh, of an inch. So, you know, from the huge to the, to, to, to the tiny. The problem is, however, that the O-rings become less malleable when the temperature drops as they get colder. And the forecast temperature for the launch date of the Challenger was 37, the forecast temperature was 37 degrees Fahrenheit. The lowest temperature of any previous launch had been 53 degrees Fahrenheit. And because of this, Morton Theocol, who knew it got the, the O-rings got less malleable, didn't want to go ahead with the launch. 
you probably recall Richard Feynman dipping a segment of O-ring in, in a jug of iced water and showing that it became less malleable. Morton Theogol, Theogol knew about this and didn't want to go ahead with the launch. But there was a problem. The problem was the launch had already been delayed five times. And because of that, it was beginning to, NASA was beginning to suffer from media ridicule. Dan Rather on the evening news went on to make jokes about them. You know, there was a hatch bolt problem and then the forecast wind was too much and so on. So they had to keep delaying. Um, moreover, this launch for the first time was carrying a, an ordinary person. That's why they described it. It was a school teacher, Krista McAuliffe, for the purposes of public understanding of science, propagation of science and, and, and so on. So there's a lot of media attention. And worse still, the next day, the uh, President's State of the Union address was scheduled, and it was thought likely that he would refer to Krista McAuliffe. So in the end, after this three-hour teleconference, Morton Theocol backed down and said, OK, you can go ahead with the launch. And then one minute into the flight, nine miles high, uh, a jet of hot gas from a booster rocket broke through the O-ring seal, uh, projected onto the side of the giant fuel tank, which blew up. One minute into the flight, nine miles up, the pod carrying the um, astronauts went into a ballistic trajectory, reached 12 miles, and then crashed to the sea, killing them all. What's all this got to do with invisible data? Well, this was the plot that the, this was the, the three-hour teleconference looked at the night before, on which they based their decision whether to go ahead. Now, each dot on this plot it corresponds to one launch of um, the space shuttle. The horizontal axis shows you the temperature at which the launch, launch occurs, and the vertical axis shows you the number of O-rings in that launch which suffered from thermal distress. So, for instance, you can see that the launch at about 63 degrees Fahrenheit here, one of the O-rings suffer, suffered thermal distress. You can see it at a low temperature, three of the... Aha. Uh -huh. Three of the O-rings suffered from thermal distress. But at the highest temperature of any launch, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, two did. And they looked at this and said there doesn't appear to be any relationship between temperature and whether an O-ring is likely to suffer from thermal distress. And on the basis of that, they went ahead with the launch. Now, you've been looking at this for a couple of minutes now, and you will have spotted something rather odd about this data set, about this plot. What you will have spotted is that it seems that every launch of the space shuttle involves at least one O-ring suffering from thermal distress. Now, surely that's unlikely. Surely there ought to be the occasional launch where none of the O-rings suffer from thermal distress. And if you actually know how many launches there have been, you'll recognise that is the case. But the data about those is missing. What it means is that we ought to have some plots, some dots along this horizontal axis. There's missing data, there's invisible data, data which ought to be there but isn't. Let me put that data in for you. There it is. Now it gives you a completely different perspective on whether there's a relationship between O-ring distress and temperature. Quite clearly, if the temperature's high, the probability of O-ring distress is very low. If the temperature's low, it's much higher. Indeed, if you know, I could draw a vertical line at sort of 63 degrees Fahrenheit and everything below that would have suffered distress. Very few of the ones above would, would have so invisible data, what it means is that if the temperature is high, very low chance of thermal distress, and conversely, by implication, if the temperature is low, very high chance. And remember, the forecast temperature for the launch was down there on the bottom left, 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Would you have gone ahead with the launch? Invisible data. Here's another less dramatic example. This is... Um, from the Labour Force Survey in the UK. The Labour Force Survey is carried out in four waves, which are the thin lines. Ignore those. Focus your attention on the overall aggregate, the, 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 the sum total, which is the thick line uh, down the middle. This is the response rate. It starts on the left, the year 2000, uh, at about 70%. So 70% of the people responded, answered the questions. And it's been going down uniformly over time. This graph ends in 2015. And it has dropped to 45%. What that means is that 55% that of the population aren't responding. They're invisible. We don't know how they would have responded. What we do know is that they're different from the 45% because the 45% did respond, the 55% didn't. Isn't it quite likely that they would be different in other ways? So that any conclusions you draw based on a straightforward analysis of the 45% could be wrong because of the data you don't see, the invisible data. 
I, I should say this is not a problem unique to the Labour Force Survey in the UK. It's not even a problem unique to UK surveys. This is a problem which is inflicting surveys globally and is causing a lot of problems to statisticians, obviously, but to governments and economists as they try to work out how, how to, what to do with about this. I've got three other little examples of invisible data. The first one here is a hypothetical one, and then I get back to some real ones. I'm going to give you this hypothetical one because I think it drives home the point in a very forceful way. I'm going to imagine a magazine which wants to find out if, it, if its readers reply to magazine surveys, so it asks one question. Do you reply to... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and funnily enough, it discovers that apparently all readers reply to surveys. Now, as far as I'm aware, no magazine has actually done that. Here's an example of something that a magazine really did do. The actuary. Probably should have known better. Um, so this is from an editorial a few years ago. A couple of months ago, I invited all 16,000 members of the Institute of Actuaries to participate in an online survey concerning the sex of actuarial, actuarial offspring. It was a sort of entertainment sort of thing. And they got some people who replied... A number, 13, in fact, replied. Not 13,000, 13. I, I, I have to say that the actuary had the good sense not to analyse the 13 people who had replied <laughs> and draw conclusions about the proportions of, of the sex ratios of actuarial offspring. Um, but had it been 13,000, maybe they would have done. But that would have been so risky because of the invisible data. In this case, as it turned out, practically all the data was invisible. I, 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 I'm not quite accurate. The actuary did draw one conclusion from this result, a conclusion which I think was perfectly valid. It drew the conclusion that actuaries don't reply to online surveys. Which <laughs> <one>. <laughs> and then my final example, coming more up to the present, um, you probably remember this. It swept the eastern seaboard of, of the States a few years ago, and 20 million tweets were sent during the course of the... It's regarded as a triumph of social media, because in real time... As it happens, people are telling you what's going on. You know, the roof's blown off my house and things have collapsed, cars have crashed, been swept away, whatever. So that you can decide where to send the emergency services to. So a triumph for the social media. Things, I said, sounds wonderful earlier. Things are getting better and better, aren't they? But, you knew there was going to be a but. Most of the tweets came from Manhattan. Few from these other places. Um, which were much more severely affected than Manhattan. Manhattan, the subway was flooded and so on, but in these other places, you know, houses were blown down and, and so on. And why was that? Well, I'm talking about invisible data, so you know why it was. It's because there are lots more people with smartphones in Manhattan or tweeting madly, um, because power outage, outages meant that phones elsewhere couldn't be recharged. They could in Manhattan. In fact, one can imagine a community which was entirely obliterated by the hurricane. You wouldn't get any messages from them. And that's, yet that's where you should be sending the emergency services. So, invisible data. Okay, so those are my two main things that I'm going to go through. I'm now going to give you one example from each of the other categories of data problems. One is changing data. Not the data you've got, uh, but the data you'll have. And I'm going to talk about, well, statisticians call, call this non-stationary. Things will change. I mentioned the economy as an example. But here's a little example. This is, again, from my own work from a number of years ago. What this plot shows you is the amount of consumer credit in the UK, starting in 1966, when the first credit card was launched in the UK, and this particular graph ends in 2000. And it's a very good fit. To the, I haven't shown you the data, but it's a very good fit to the data. And what it shows you is that the amount of consumer credit in the UK is increasing exponentially. So now I'm going to ask, what do you think is going to happen next? Is this curve going to go on increasing exponentially forever? I mean, this is Imperial College. You know the answer to that. Is it going to go on increasing exponentially forever? Or is something else going to happen? Is it perhaps going to flatten out in a sigmoid curve? Or is it perhaps going to fall off a cliff edge? I, I like to... I used to give this talk... I used to show this graph around to banks, um, I was trying to persuade them to adopt a different way of um, building credit scoring models, and I used to show them this around the, two, the year 2000. So I'd like to claim that um, I predicted a financial crisis, that there would, in fact, be a crisis. Of course, it's completely nonsense, because I didn't say when it was going to happen, but it's obvious to everybody that it can't go on like that. Okay. So non-stationary, the, the world is going to change. 
I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I know it's not going to be like the past. This, this exponential curve isn't going to go on increasing. What about alternative data? Not the data you've got, but the data you would have had. A counterfactual, if you like, I gave the example of a clinical trial. If you gave them a, the, the patients a treatment, you'd like to have known how they would have responded to the other treatment. Here's another example. Credit card transaction fraud detection. What we'll be doing here is we will have a device, a, a system which monitors the transactions as you make them, and if it looks suspicious, you'll get a phone call saying, did you make this transaction? And it will stop the transaction before it's made. Are you making, is it a legitimate transaction? But then occasionally you'll get a startup company with its deep learning neural network, which will say, we've got a much better method of detecting fraud, and you'll want to carry out a comparative trial to see which one's better. So we'll compare the existing detector with a proposed new one, and think about what we'll do. We'll stop a transaction when the existing method says that's suspicious. We won't stop the transaction when the new method, the proposed new method, says it's suspicious, because we don't know if that method's any good. That's the whole point of the test. Maybe it gets everything wrong. So there's a fundamental asymmetry in the way the data's being treated. It's alternative data, not the data. We, ideally, we treat the two sources of data in the same way, but we can't do that because of the circumstances of what we're trying to do. It turns out that if you do the maths behind this, that the comparison does artificially favour one of the methods. And then misleading data. Not the data you collect, but the data you think you've got. Uh, I sometimes, you can describe this as answering the wrong question. So here's an example. In the UK, crime rates are measured in two, two ways. One is the crime survey for England and Wales, and the other is the police recorded crime statistics. And I've plotted them here between 1997 and 2003. And you can see that they're going in opposite directions. Crime survey for England and Wales shows crime going down over this period. Police recorded crime statistics shows crime going up. When the media are presented with conflicting, contradictory pieces of information like this, they have a field day. The statisticians, the government, don't know what they're doing, for instance. But we'll see the explanation in a moment. Indeed, the media have a field day, and then they focus on the one where crime goes up, of course, because that's uh, in their nature. So what's going on here? Is it because somebody's got something wrong? Remember, I'm talking about answering the wrong question. Well, here's the explanation. You may not be able to read this. It doesn't really matter. These two approaches to measuring crime have subtly different and importantly different definitions. So, for instance, the crime survey for England and Wales doesn't include group residences. Uh, it doesn't include crime against commercial bodies. It's a survey. It's a victim-based survey. You don't get many murder victims raising their hand when asked a question saying, yes, I was murdered. <laughs> In contrast to that, the police recorded crime statistics. They have particular definitions of what constitutes a particular kind of crime, and it's based on that, um, according to what they call a notifiable offence list. Um, it does include murder. It does include commercial organisations. It does include residents of institutions and so on. So different definitions. Not surprising that it leads to different results. And the key point here is you need to decide which definition is most suited to the question you're trying to answer. Data can be bad in general for one purpose, but good for another. You need to work out what it is you're trying to do. So what should we do? Where does all this leave us? Well, I like to split what we should do into detection, prevention, and correction. First, we try to find out what's going on. Then we try to put in places devices which will stop it, and then we try to correct it. So, one slide for each of these. Detection. First, you should ask yourself, does the data conform to what you'd expect? Are the different data sources consistent? So, does the data conform to what you'd expect? Are there anomalies? Are there outliers? Are there sudden, dramatic, and unexpected changes? For, and I think I have a, yeah, I have a plot for that. This is, again, from my work. It's from a number of years ago. What it shows you, time on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, the proportion of customers for a loan, which were repaying their loan in, uh, in installments by direct debit. And you can see that there was a sudden change in the way new customers behaved halfway through this time period. So we were doing this work with a bank, and we, it was a big data mining exercise trying to spot anomalies and peculiarities in the data. This is one of them that we spotted. We went along to the bank and said, look, we've spotted this peculiar behavior. Your customers seem to change 
you'll be at new customers seem to be different from old customers. And they were very excited by this. Now, I should tell you, because there's a moral here, we were working with the risk division, the credit division of the bank. And they were very excited by our observation about this uh, uh, anomaly, and they spent some, time, some weeks thinking about it. And then the anomaly was resolved when one of them was in a lift riding up with somebody from the marketing branch of the bank who said, oh, yes, on that date, we insisted that all of the new customers should re repay by direct debit. But if you look closely at this, you'll find that there is another anomaly in it. If all customers should, be, should repay by direct debit, the black curve, which shows you these proportions paying direct debit, isn't, in fact, a, a straight line. Not all of the customers are paying by direct debit. So this is an example of, does the data conform to what you expect? Are there outliers, anomalies, peculiarities in the data? The second thing I've got here is, are different data sources consistent? This is triang triangulation. I suppose the crime rates would illustrate this. You get data from different things and then check that they, they, they match up. And there are other sources, other examples. Detection, prevention. Prevention involves consistency check, primarily on data entry. So in, in, in the um, clinical trial world, data is entered before, before, if it's not entered electronically, of course, was entered by, entered more than once by different independent people entering the data. So you can, you know, if one produces an error, the other one, another one is unlikely to produce the same error. So there are various ways, systems for uh, data entry for overcoming this. Um, careful design of data collection systems. Now I said, I, I sent you a test question earlier on. This, you remember, was a database of medical doctors um, and had this huge and anomalous and clearly false peak of doctors who were born on the 11th of November 1911. What do you think could have caused that problem? I'm talking about problems with data entry. It's a rhetorical question. The, the, the answer is, of course, that the people who designed the data entry system were clever. They wanted to know the birth dates of the doctors. So if you didn't enter one, if you left that field blank, you've all experienced like this, the system says, no, you've got to, gives you a red asterisk and said, you've got to fill in this space. So what do you do? You just don't want to give your birth date. You're trying to get through this form. You do what's the simplest, next, easiest thing. You just type 00, zero for the day, 00, zero for the month, 00, zero for the year. Six zeros. But the data entry people were wise to that possibility. If you did that, they the data entry system came back and effectively said, don't be silly, give me a real birth date. Well, what's the next easiest real birth date you could... Yeah, one, 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 one. That's why that peak arose. And then correction. There are some very sophisticated statistical tools for trying to correct data to see if it's consistent and then saying how, what's the best way to make it consistent? Are there missing values? What values should they occur? What values um, should there be there which wouldn't um, distort any conclusions and so on? And indeed, um, people have actually won Nobel Prizes for this. Um, James Heckman won the 2000 Nobel Prize um, in economics. There isn't a Nobel Prize in statistics um, for uh, uh, methods for overcoming invisible data, essentially. But there is a cautionary note here. Just because, just because there are such methods, they can't, you know, statisticians can't perform miracles. If they could, you'd just give me one data point and I'd infer everything there was to know about anything on the basis of that. You, you, know, you have to have a certain level of um, validity and accuracy to the data. So where does all this leave us? I'm going to give you some recommendations, three recommendations. First... Consider the origin of the face data. Don't take it at face value. That's been a theme underlying everything I've said so far. Here's a little example. So I was at a conference of bankers, and one of them said to me, we don't have any fraud at my bank. Now, he said it with a straight face. Either he was deluded, or more probably, he didn't want to admit the extent of fraud at his bank because of the reputational damage. But don't take it at face value. Second... Sense check. Here's a figure from the 1970 US census. It showed that 289 boys had been both widowed and divorced by the age of 14. <laughs> Sense check. And then finally, 
and this is a recommendation, uh, an important recommendation, I think. Statistics and data science master's degrees should have a module on data quality. The reason for that is, if you're teaching a particular data mining, machine learning, statistical technique, you have to focus on the properties of the technique. If you're teaching regression, you'll say it minimizes this criteria and it behaves in this way, this is how you use it, and so on. You can't afford to, at that stage, say, but you need good data and what will happen if the data's missing and all sorts of things. Because if you do that, you'll never actually get anywhere and the students will never understand the technique. So what you do is you first have a course on regression where they assume, essentially, the data is perfect and of high quality. And then later on, you have a course saying, this is what you should do if the data aren't perfect, if the sorts of problems that I've enumerated occur. This is quite, it's quite a good idea to have a separate module on this because the ideas, the principles about how you cope with poor quality data are sort of universal across different statistical techniques. So that's a recommendation. Now, you've all seen, you're probably all familiar with this quote from Chris Anderson, who used to edit Wired magazine. With enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. He's saying, we don't need theories anymore. We don't need models. <laughs> We've got all of the data, which is never true. You've seen my comments about invisible data. Um, so we can just rely on the numbers, he's saying. Funnily enough, I came across a very similar quote, <laughs> but different in an important way, dating back 130 years from the economist Alfred Marshall. He said, the most reckless and treacherous of all theorists is he who professes to let facts and figures speak for themselves. <laughs> so take that, Chris Anderson. <laughs> so what I'd like to conclude by saying is if the data can speak for themselves, they can also lie for themselves. Yes, how I started. Great promise for improving the human condition, but data alone are not sufficient, it's still necessary to think. Thank you. Am I on? Yes, I am. Thank you very much, David. So now we have the opportunity, oh God, if I can see you, um, for you to ask some questions. And there are a couple of, ah, thank you. There are a couple of microphones on each side. And so we'll start over here. I see my first hand. Well, firstly, David, thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, after the polls closed on Brexit, the evidence from the exchange rate was that the smart money in financial institutions were expecting a no vote. Which aspect of the problems with data do you think led to them being wrong? <laughs> I'm not sure if the answer really lies with the problems with data. Well, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I think there are a number of reasons, aren't there? It's like um, people not being honest about what they were going to do, distortions, perhaps problems with the, with the way the polls were um, conducted. I, I think there are a number of possible uh, reasons. But I'm reminded of the um, Margaret Thatcher, one, once when Margaret Thatcher was elected, when, in retrospect, it was thought that people weren't being honest. They were embarrassed, if you'd like, to say they were going to vote Conservative. And so that led to a, a distortion. But I think what you have to remember, I mean, we shouldn't get into Brexit, perhaps, but, you know... <laughs> Not now. No, OK. <laughs> We've got dinner to do Let's that. Let's go for another question. <laughs> OK, there was another hand down here in the white shirt. I'm looking over this side. Everybody seems very quiet. Thanks, Professor Sands. You mentioned the increasing volume of data and also the improved improvements in computing power. Do you feel that the human incomprehensibility of the data, but the computing power increasing, is that making the problem bigger or smaller? Or are they both increasing and so does the problem? Yeah. That's a very nice question. Clearly, what it's doing is increasing the opportunities. Um, but as I said, the computer is now a necessary intermediary. You can't do it. So when I, you know, years ago, when I started learning statistics, the first thing I was taught was familiarize myself with the data. Look at it this way, look at it that way. And I, I can do that with 100 or 1,000 data points, but with a billion data points, I can't. I have to rely on the computer. Um, and I can only look at the data. I have to tell the computer, look at the data this way, summarize it this way, calculate the mean variance, whatever, plot it this way. There is a risk that I will miss things which had I thought to plot it the right way or whatever, would have been obvious. 
that risk, I think, is always there. And I think that's coupled with the problem, a potential problem with algorithms, which is that an algorithm will always give you a number. No matter how poor the data, no matter what, throw the numbers at the algorithm, it'll spit out a number. And of course, that can be misleading. Okay, here on the center aisle. Uh, comment and a question. With regards to the first part of your talk about how we are getting there, wouldn't you include connectivity as one of the reasons for the amount of large data we have and are going to have going forwards, especially if you look at the IoT? Second question, aren't we always going to be constrained by the limitations of an algorithm and its structure in terms of the results? Hence, data analysis is not really the only answer. Yeah. Your first, the first question, uh, first part of the question, absolutely right. Interactions. Um, if you've got a lot of data points and they're independent, you can relatively simply draw statistical conclusions about them. When things start to interact, um, then things become much more complicated. They become non-linear and so on, and, and the, the things do become tougher. And I think we will see increasingly difficult data analytic challenges uh, because of that. Um, a, man, a few years ago now, uh, a few decades ago, a man named Charles Perrault came up with what he called a theory of normal accidents, where he said, essentially, we should expect nasty catastrophes and accidents because of unexpected interactions between and within complex systems. So I think you've put your finger on something there, and I can't remember what the second question was. with regards to the limitations of an algorithm, uh, in essence, giving you a specific or defined result, and hence the limitation of data analysis. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's right. I think this is, that's really what I mean by, you have to say how you want to look at the data, and the algorithm will give you that view of the data. And you might be missing something very important, something crucial, something potentially catastrophic or whatever. Um, but I don't, there isn't anything else, I think. I, maybe, maybe that's not quite true. Um, of course, with adaptive systems, they can perhaps begin to look at other views of the data which you didn't think of, thinking of looking at. But um, it's a problem, yes. I had a hand down here, and then I can't see anyone else. Um, thank you. I'm sort of intrigued about 100 years ago, or way in the midst of time, it's sort of, you sort of implied there wasn't much data, but there was quite a lot of thinking. And you sort of implied today there's an awful lot of data, but perhaps not quite enough thinking. So is there an optimal data <laughs> thinking ratio? And, and have we reached peak thinking? And is it all going to trail off? <laughs> what a wonderful question. Actually, I think that's a question for an economist rather than a statistician. <laughs> Coward. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 go on. One last one down here. He's an economist. So. <laughs> Thank you for the lecture, David. Really enjoyed that. You, you, you had this dramatic graph of the declining response rates to labour force survey. Can you just talk a little bit about that as yeah. to why do we think that people are not responding so much? And given that you know we have alternative data sources, we can cross-check these things by, but there are some things where we really do want people to respond. Opinion polls, for example, was mentioned earlier on. Um, maybe say something a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah. So as I said, it, it, it's a global, global problem. It could be that people have just got a sort of exhausted with replying to surveys. It could be um, that there are there are other sources of data. They don't want to interact, but you know, they're getting suspicious about um, uh, answering questions. Perhaps they're suspicious of government and so on. Um, I, I should say there are statistical ways, well, I mentioned this in the context of invisible data, of trying to uh, adjust those, but they can't um, perform miracles. Um, but there are other sources of data, so-called administrative data that I did mention, where, where you can get data from transactions which are people, people are carrying out anyway. But that 
that has its own limitations. The point about a survey is you can say, I want to answer this question. And then you can design your survey and the survey questions to target what it is you want to know. For administrative data, the way people behave in supermarkets or with credit cards or, or around, move around London or whatever, you, you can't necessarily answer exactly the question you want to. So a lot of opportunity there, but it doesn't overcome the, the, the fundamental problems. Thank you. So the time has now come to actually say thank you to David for a fantastic presentation. It's not easy to bring a difficult and complex subject to a level where the likes of me can understand it. And David, thank you very much for doing a fantastic job. And I think what I should take away from today is that we perhaps need to change our saying that there are lies, damn lies, and poor data. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, not just yet, um, we would like to uh, show you a short video which is telling you about the uh, new developments that are happening at White City. So, thank you very much. Is it about to happen? There we go. It's almost like open source in terms of a building. Where people sit in the building, they can move around very easily. The kind of facilities in a particular space, they can be changed. So it's, it literally is pop-up science for real. We'll identify a challenge, we'll tackle it for two or three years. Once it's sold, that group will dissolve, it'll move away, the infrastructure will kind of change, and it gives us a flexibility that we've never, never had before. The first thing we're going to be leaders on is really break down barriers between the academic disciplines and universities. As you walk into any university in the world, the way that science and engineering are practiced are pretty much still separated into silos of chemistry, physics, mathematics, engineering. So now with this new campus, we're now imagining breaking down all the barriers. Now there's no longer a department of X. This is now just a science and technology hub where everything comes together. To me, that's a very exciting way of working. I think that we're wanting to tackle global challenges that are facing society and I guess I'm best placed to give you one example which would be food security because it's where my own research interests lie. But this could in fact be any global challenge really because I think the principle is the same in that if you're really wanting to make a step change with research, you need to bring in academics from all sorts of different departments, be that, in our case, biologists, and physicists, engineers, and chemists, which I think lies at the heart of a lot of these challenges. Then we can start to have discussions at the interface of all these different disciplines, and the building can act as a central sort of hub for that. It's gonna change the way we organize our research and the way we interact with each other. And that, obviously, as a knock-off effect, will have a great impact on the way we train our particular or postgraduate students. It's going to enhance the experience that they have. They will have a state-of-the-art equipment. They will work alongside leaders in the field. Not only that, because we have the opportunity to work with the stakeholders, with industrial partners. So what we're talking about here is something that's different, something that no one's really thought about. We're not talking about industry coming along and visiting us every three months, every six months. We're talking about true co-location, partnership with industry, partnership with external stakeholders. And that comes back to this kind of idea, it's more than just a building. It really is a community. The facilities within it, you won't find them elsewhere. You know, molecular hack spaces where basically you can turn any idea into a reality and kind of in, in at high speed. A challenge room for our industrial partners where they can present their challenges and we put bespoke audiences together for them to generate solutions in, in kind of real time. Entrepreneurship hubs so that our students can basically take their ideas and turn them into small startup companies. The next door to Medical Sciences Research Hub is what's called the Translation Hub, which is literally a plus 20,000 metre building which is designed to house small startups. And again, that doesn't just help the undergraduates, it helps us. 
It's not every time in life you get a chance to do something game-changing, and this is what this is. It's more than just bricks and mortar. I think it's the ethos that it's going to create that's going to be really exciting. I think it's great that Imperial College has so much faith in the academics to invest such an enormous amount of resources into creating this new space for us to play in. It's a fantastic opportunity to shape the future of chemistry, not only at Imperial, but help shaping the future of chemistry uh, around the world. So, now truly finally, if you go out the doors either side, uh, there'll be people showing you where you can find yourself a, a drink and something to eat. Thank you very much, everybody.